So my name is Scott Fleischman, and I've been beating really hard on the hacking around with Agda on my own lately. And it's a, it's a really hard language to get started. And I don't think it's because Agda itself is that complicated. I think it's because the people that like it and really use it are graduate students in mathematics or type theory or something. And um, they have all this extra stuff, all their examples that they use are from things I didn't know that I want to learn, but I still haven't learned them yet. And so it's harder, just like, what's, what's really going on here at the core? And so, you know, I've sat through courses on, by Bob Harper and, you know, read and lots of tutorials, watched Oregon, Oregon um, summer school programming languages seminars and stuff, and read a lot. And so what I'm hoping to share with you is kind of a nice little kind of walking this tightrope of not falling into these huge subjects that you could, you know, get a PhD in and still learn about Agda and have fun programming. For me, Agda is my favorite language, programming language. It's, um, I've studied an undergraduate degree, lots of uh, computer science, mathematics, and philosophy, logic. Um, and so Agda unites all the three together so I can program, have this like programming mode, or I could do some logical proofs and have this logical side. Or I can prove things about mathematics, have an alternate foundation for mathematics other than uh, set theory or something. And it's all the same system. So that's what I like about it. Uh, from the Agda wiki, like I said, it's a dependently typed functional programming language. Um, Agda itself is also a proof assistant. So it's going to help you writing proofs. Um, and it's based on intuitionistic type theory. So there's a theory behind it that's pretty old. I guess you could say it started in 1908 with Bertrand Russell, where he's trying to create a formal system for mathematics using set theory, but then you run into, you notice these paradoxes, right? The set of all sets that don't contain themselves. It's like, well, does it contain itself or not? Um, it seems it could be both. So he started off with the idea of this theory of types, which kind of a type can't talk about itself. So then a set, you can't talk about a set containing itself anymore. You have this hierarchy that just kind of goes on up. Um, of course, Alonzo Church in the 30s with a lambda calculus, that you can actually encode all of mathematics, numbers and stuff, using pure functions. Nothing but the idea of substitution is a really fascinating start. Um, but really, type theory really comes together with per Martin Loaf in the 1970s, where he created this theory. And he, uh, it's a foundation for mathematics, but it's also, you can view it as a programming language. It's like the same system that you can look at in different ways and interpret in different ways. And that's really what Agda is. And Agda is kind of an implementation of a type theory so that the computer can check your proofs for you. And so when you write an Agda program and it type checks, I feel like you've kind of achieved something um, because you've sort of proven what you at least stated. And well, maybe what you stated isn't what you thought you stated, but your um, implementation that your program actually matches that. Um, Agda itself was first written by Katarina Kokand in 1999. There's a total rewrite, Ulf Norell in 2007, um, for his PhD thesis, wrote and improved the meta theory about um, Agda. And so really when people say Agda, they mean this Agda 2. Um, all right, so the key topics, there's really not a lot of core topics. Uh, creating inductive types, so inductive meaning like natural numbers, they can, they're like potentially infinite, but um, always actually finite, you know. Give me a number, I can always create a bigger one, but I always have a finite number that we're talking about. I won't go into co-inductive types today. Uh, functions, specifically total functions. So we're always dealing with the input, everything in the input uh, set or type, and equality. And the equality is what really gives us our notion of proof. Um, it's kind of pervasive everywhere. So what I'm going to do is do some really basic kind of functional pro programming in Agda with Booleans and then jump right into dependent types and talk about equality and some proofs about those types and functions that we've created. And so it's kind of like really easy and then it'll deep dive down pretty deep. Um, and you might get lost, but then it'll kind of come back up. And we'll go back to something a little easier. Um, natural numbers, and we'll talk about those and kind of do some proofs on those. Um, equality will kind of already be pervasive, but there's some neat uh, properties of equality that Agda kind of gives you for free. And then we'll shift gears a little bit Depending on time, hopefully we'll get to these last two in some detail. If not, I can at least do a real couple basic things. Logic, specifically constructive logic. Uh, when I say constructive logic versus classical logic is usually what people uh, sort of contrast. 
Classical logic, you get the law of excluded middle, which means a statement is either true or false. Um, and so constructive logic doesn't start with that premise, but it doesn't deny it either. And I can actually, I hope I'll get to show you a proof in Agda that although you can't say a proposition is true or false, you can, um, it's not true that it's not true a proposition is true or false. So like the double negation of that. And then uh, the typical thing people do with uh, Agda is show you a vector, which is a really weird name for a list where the, um, how long of a list it is is always present. Um, and so that's what I hope to cover. And the way I'm going to do that uh, is by coding, live coding, and kind of going through that. And then um, there's a pretty big crowd, so I don't, I'm not going to assume everybody has Agda installed or anything. But if you're following along, I'll give some time for exercises in the middle. And I'll just kind of work through those silently and give a couple minutes so you can hack on something if you have it. But if not, you can follow along, and I'll discuss those. Um, but by and large, you'll be live coding and maybe kind of going back to the slides. If you have questions, feel free to shout it out. Sometimes I'm a little focused or something. I might not hear it, but um, just give a shout out and I'll try to explain it. And I also want to mention, I've gone through this talk a couple times. I've gone through it with a couple linguist colleagues of mine that really don't know anything about programming. And they're able to follow along for a while. And then at a certain point, all the new abstract concepts like come together and they get a little lost. But um, they're able to track pretty well, so I was really happy with that. And also. Um, ran through a couple of versions of this with developer colleagues and uh, actually a similar kind of thing happens. It's <laughs> if because uh, none of them were really m much of functional programmers so it was a lot of new stuff and but I think everybody seemed to enjoy it from the feedback so far. All right so like I said here one of the main key topics is inductive types. So is this big enough for everybody? Is that readable? Okay it's great. Kind of what have. What's that? So I'm using Agda 251. I think for the most part, you'll be okay with an older version, although there's one option that I'm going to set, which is explicit. Um, what is it? Oh, I didn't put it in here somewhere. Uh, here, in like one of the exercises. You'll see at the top, I'm using this exact split option, and that's available. That's not available in earlier versions. So um, what's nice about that is it forces you to define your functions so that each, equal, each definitional, um, each line of equality you do, you know, each case that you define is, definition, is guaranteed to be definitionally equal because you can, because I have the case splits, I'll show you that in a little bit, but um, by and large you should be okay with an older version. I haven't really tested it other than, you know, if you try to do the exercise you'll hit errors with things like that. And also Agda 2.51 has these built-in stuff. I don't, I think for the most part I redefine all the basics, so I don't, Maybe in the list exercises, I use some of the built-ins. Um, but by and large, you should be OK with an older version. OK, so types. Let's create an inductive type. And I think the best way to start is with a Boolean. So you give it a name. Data is a keyword, Boolean. And it's a set. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to worry about the difference between a type and a set. I'm going to use them interchangeably. Um, you can get into pretty gnarly philosophical discussions about some subtleties there, but um, a set, it's a type for, for our purposes. So um, now we're going to define the elements of the set, or what we call constructors. So true is a Boolean, and false is a Boolean. Um, and if you're following along at home, uh, Agda, the Emacs mode is control C, control L to load it, and that will type check the file you have. I pretty much do it all the time. I think probably an editor should like auto save it or auto load it all the time to some degree. This reminds me back in like 20 or 30 years ago when auto save was in the default. I'm always like constantly saving it to make sure I didn't, didn't lose anything. All right, so that means, so the key notation here is this colon. So that can read Boolean is a set or has type set. Um, true has type Boolean and false has type Boolean. So now we've created this kind of dichotomy of we have a set that has elements in it, but even the set you can talk about the name Boolean, well, is a set. So everything kind of has something above it. Um, and the way you ask, like, what is the type of something? You hit Control C, Control D for deduce type or infer type, and see down at the bottom we get 
expression. So if we type in Boolean, it'll tell us a Boolean is a set. Um, and if we do that again, control C, control D, and we type in true, it infers that true is a Boolean. Um, so that's pretty easy. There's a syntactical thing that uh, you can write the same thing like this, but if, you, if they're all really simple elements here, these are called constructors, true and false, data constructors. You can put them on one line, especially if you have like 10 or something, it can get pretty long. Um, okay, great. There are some degenerate cases that we might come back to. We'll definitely come back to the empty case, but you can create a type that has exactly one um, element in it, unit, and that's useful for, it's kind of like there's only, there's only one way to create this thing, so it, it, um, it comes in handy later, let me put it that way. And then a really degenerate case, which you might not ever even think of doing, um, is the empty set. There's no way to create something of the empty set. And uh, that might seem kind of strange, but it's very useful for proofs of negation because essentially you're gonna say that a statement is true if you can create an element of it and it's false if you can't. And so Agda is gonna allow us to create a proof of something, you're gonna be able to create something of that type or false if you can't. So this, so in some sense, this is like truth. And then sometimes you'll see people even abbreviate unit with like TT for true or something. And then empty, another name, like people give these things different names. You see void, uh, zero, because there's like zero ways to create it. And then some people even call this thing one because there's exactly one way to create that set. And in that case, this thing would be a, a two because there's two ways to create it. Um, so those are, sometimes you'll see people working on that level. Uh, I'll go back to Boolean for now though. All right, I'm gonna change this to empty so I don't get myself confused. All right, so let's create some functions. Do I have a thing on functions here? Uh, I think somewhere down here. Some slides, okay. So, like I said, the way you create a type, you give the set or type a name, and then notice that name appears all the way down the side here, and each of these are different constructors. Um, okay, so functions. Uh, one thing I want to say, if you just want to give a name to anything, you can say, hey, I'm going to give a specific name to a Boolean, so call it my bool, right? There, everything you uh, give a name to will have a type and a term. So you say, my bool has type Boolean, and it's like, well, which Boolean is it? Well, in this case, my bool is going to be true. Um, and then so you can ask Agda to sort of tell me, well, what is my bool reduced to? So if you say control C, control N, and you type in an expression, it will try to you know, reduce it all the way. So you said my bool is equal to true. Well, you type in my bool there, it's gonna reduce it to true. It's kind of straightforward, but it gets, it'll get more interesting once we hit create functions. So if you create my first function, it has a type. Now, functions are somewhat special in that um, you know, they use these arrows. And so the thing on the left, is gonna be a name of a set, and the thing on the right is also gonna be a name on the set. So we can create a function from Boolean, you can create an error like that, to Boolean. Um, Agda is really Unicode friendly, so it gives you lots of funny ways to type in cool Unicode characters. So if you type backslash, and then T-O, then you can get a, uh, a little Unicode arrow, or sometimes backslash R, and then down at the bottom you can see there, you can choose lots of different arrows. Uh, <laughs> the one that works for functions is only the first one now, but you can use other arrows for whatever you want. A uh, question. Yep. Uh, well, the quest. Could you not use the Unicode characters so that those of us who don't know the magic incantations can go? Sure. Um, follow along. Sure. I, um, if you go to this repo, if you go to GitHub and just search for Agda for nothing, I've summarized some of them here. And then if you go to the Agda docs, you can list all of them. <laughs> Um, but this is kind of what you type and what you get. But um, sure, uh, remind me if I forget. I'll try to try to avoid doing that. But Thank you. sometimes I can't resist. Uh, <laughs> the Unicode arrow is actually required, or no? 
No, you can do either one. So this one will work fine. A, a minus and a greater than symbol. All right, where was I? Question? Yep. Yeah, so um, for the Boolean example, does it matter for our implementation whether it's like true or false or in a particular order? Like I know it's a set, but like for this particular exercise, does it matter like if say false was before true? Does that have any significance? No, not really. Um, not for the purposes of what you might call the core language, but with reflection or something, you might be able to enumerate over it. I, I can't remember if that matters. Um, but generally, no. Just the name. All right, so. Follow up question. Yeah. Does it, does it matter for, for the. Um, if, you, if you build an if, does, does the, other, the other matter is to automatically extract uh, the, the data structure or a recursion principle from Boolean? Or? We'll get to if. And maybe that. Um, we'll see if your question's answered once I define what an if looks like. Um, there's no ifs by default in the language. All right, so the way you, like here, the way you create a function is typically you have um, what's called pattern matching. So on the left you say you have to deal with each case. So you have to deal with a true case, uh, maybe, and then my function, the false case. Um, so this is, so the idea is that you give a Boolean input and then give a Boolean output. So this one, if you um, pass in true, you'll get back out true, and if you pass in false, you get back out false. Um, and you can sort of run or normalize or reduce the expression by doing a control C, control N, and typing in an expression like my function, and you give it an argument true. And if you hit enter, it reduces down to true. Well, that's pretty straightforward. So people typically call this the identity function um, because it sort of it gives you what you gave it. Uh, another function that you can create, let's do not, so, whoops. Not takes true and returns false, and not takes false and returns true. So control C, control L to load it, and if you wanna like, test it a little bit, control C, control N to normalize, and you say not false, that turns into not true, or turns into true and not um, true, reduce down false. Uh, there's a couple Nice things that this gives you, uh, that Agda gives you rather. So um, what you can do is instead, maybe you don't, like identity, it doesn't even matter what, what all the cases are because you know you're just gonna give it back the same thing. So you can give a name to the thing on the left and then the thing on the right, you can just return that. So now identity takes in a Boolean, let's call it X, and I'm just gonna give you back that Boolean. So if we, um, reduce that expression again. If we do identity of false, of course we get back false. Could you speak a little louder? Can you make identity multiple 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 multiple? Yes, we can. I don't think I'll do that right this moment, but very soon we'll show you how to do polymorphism. It has a, has a different flavor than something like Haskell or ML because um, everything's a parameter. Um, and so essentially a polymorphic function in Agda is really a dependent function where the first thing that you give it is the set and the next thing you need to know the name of that set. I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, when we run the compiler again, then it says skipping. But, so by default it doesn't do recompile. Oh, so like that? If it says skipping, that means you probably didn't change it? Nope. Even when it's changed. Uh, like when you run it from the command line? Yeah, well, I might skip other things, I'm not sure. Um, like if I hear, woo, that's kind of small. So if I did something like agda, and I said agda from nothing, uh, well, yeah. So if you've loaded an Emacs, it's creating this .agda i file, which is essentially a binary serialized form of the type check information. And so if you've loaded it in Agda already, you've done a control C, control L, and you go to the command line and try to do that, it's going to skip it because by doing the load within Emacs, um, it's already compiled it so it doesn't have to recheck it.
All right, so I'm going to show you another fun thing. So let's redefine not and give it a value x. Um, Agda has these things called holes or goals. So if you type a question mark and then load, you get this cool little green thing with a number by it. And at the bottom, it, know, it knows what type. So it's expecting you to put something in this hole of type Boolean. And if you do control C, control comma, you will see that kind of the, con like the goal that you have and the context that you have so far to get there. So in this case, it expects the Boolean, so this Boolean is the result, and then it says that, hey, we have something called X that is type Boolean right there. Um, and that's a lot of fun. I, I use holes all the time, and then the exercises also have holes. You can just fill in the value. Um, and if you type the name of a, a parameter here, X, and you do control C, control C, that uh, case splits. So it gives you both of the cases that you've defined up above. Um, for navigation, if you do control C, control F, there's like forward for the next hole, so you can go forward, and then control C, control B for backward a hole, and that'll kind of allow you to navigate through the holes. Um, and then you can do the same thing. So if you type in something, you can fill the hole and have it check that what you've typed is actually of type Boolean. It's like it matches the goal. If you hit control C, control space, we'll fill that in for you. If I do control C, control F to go to the next hole, and then I type in, I want this case to be false, control C, control space, it type checks. But say for instance, I had typed something that didn't work, like XYZ, I don't have an XYZ, and I try to hit control space, it's gonna complain, say I don't know what XYZ is. All right, so now we got, we have two functions. Um, let's do a more complicated function, and so and is, uh, takes two booleans as input, but in Agda, um, all functions take one parameter. So how do you do that? Well, if you're familiar with functional programming, um, you're familiar with currying, and that is essentially that you can simulate um, do something equivalent to having a function of multiple parameters by having a function that takes the first parameter returning some other function that takes one parameter and so on. You can, it scales up. So when you see expressions like with bunches of arrows, by default, this arrow here will associate to the right. So it's equivalent to that. Um, and I can show you if anybody's interested kind of what that looks like. So now with case splitting, the fun thing with Agda is you can, now we have two parameters, but I just want to say for the most part, you can just kind of pretend that it takes two arguments and just kind of read it like, okay, this takes one argument and this takes an, another, you know, takes an argument and the final thing is a Boolean. Uh, and for the most part, even in this little workshop, that's how you can read it. Uh, so you can type separated by spaces, um, both of these things, and hit control C, control C, and it will case split all the possibilities there. So that, it becomes really handy because later on when we get dependent types, some of these types will be constrained so that all of the impossible cases will not show up in the results. Um, so and, if either of the two sides are false, then it's false. So we can say false, 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 and this case is true. Okay, yeah, so when you're in a hole, it's control, if you type something, and you hit control C, control space, and that will, f that will check it and fill it in if, it's, um, if it checks, okay. Is, is the case splitting in some drop-down menu or anything? Uh, I think, yeah, there is a menu, so let's see. Um, uh, let's see, I don't have a case split, but I think up here, the Agda menu does have, doesn't have case split, eh. No, I guess not. Yeah, it's sort of like, you use case splitting a lot. It's really, really convenient. So it, it's kind of one of those shortcuts that I end up memorizing. Um, there are a lot of shortcuts, and I don't use a lot of them in my own stuff. So on the, on the GitHub page, I've summarized what I think are the most, well, the ones that I commonly use. And then if you look at the Agda docs, they'll give you a, um, a comprehensive list of all of them. There's, there's quite a bit. 
Are there more questions at this point? Yeah. Uh, Emacs is pretty much the only um, interactive front end to Agnes. It's not the only one, but it's sort of the go-to. I think the Atom one now, there's an uh, Agna mode for Atom that I've seen people use. Uh, I haven't tried using it myself, though. The Vim but. one is good. What's that? The Vim one is good. Oh, Vim one? Yeah, so there's a Vim one also. Yes? Okay, um, but your cursor isn't a goal? Yeah, sometimes. So if, if, you have, if you have goals like this and they're green, but you, then you change stuff elsewhere, you really need to reload it because it, it, it'll get confused. So like I'm, I'm doing Control-C, Control-L all the time. Um, true. Okay, uh, so, okay, let's, let's play around with some more like syntactical level stuff. Can you show the whole slide, please? Sure, let's see. Boom, how about that? Um, okay, so Agda, <laughs> Agda has, Agda uses underscores in lots of interesting ways, and I'll show you a really fun one. Um, so in Haskell, if you wanted to say something like false and false with the and in the middle, you're kind of out of luck. You have to use like some funky symbol, you know, like whatever. Um, but in Agda, you can define the function name by putting underscores where you expect the arguments to go. So you put underscore on the left expecting, hey, something's going to go on the left. Hey, something's going to go on the right. Um, and you can use it as a prefix form like this. So now all of these are prefix forms. Uh, that was just like it is before. Like you can use it just as a normal name too, uh, and that will work fine. But also, even in the definition of of the and function, you can put and in the middle. I'm not sure if it'll. Yeah, it even likes it. Some of them prefix form and some of them infix. So you can put and in the middle here, uh, and that's a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, so I think one of the exercises is or, if I remember my exercises right. So if you go to the, if you open the exercise 01 boolean, you can define your own or. And if you want to keep going, you can define nand and nor. And I think, let me, let me double check, but if you do a case split with a mix fix like this, or the in, um, or as infix, I think it keeps it, yeah, it keeps it infix for you. So that's kind of convenient. Yes? So like for the case of and, where there's only one case that's true and everything else is false, can you consolidate those three cases? Yes, let's do that. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, well, there's a couple things you can do. So one way you might do it, um, let's look at another use of underscore and underscore equals false. Okay, so that's one way to do it. That's kind of a catch-all. Um, so in this, so underscore has different meanings in different contexts. And there's even more meanings of underscore, as you'll find out. But to the left of the equals, an underscore means, I don't care what this value is, I'm not going to use it anywhere. So there's something needs to go there, but I don't care what it is. And that's what's the case here. It's like, well, and then there's, now there's an ordering. Um, so Agda is going to, by default, go top to bottom, left to right in interpreting this. So true and true is going to equal true, and then no, it doesn't matter, whatever. But if you put this up above, uh, Agda is even going to complain. It's going to say, hey, you can't even, you'll never even see that because you've already said that everything is false. That's one way to do it. Um, and this is where I'm going to use, I like to use this new option called exact split because this is kind of creating a little equation. Uh, one thing about Agda that is kind of true everywhere is you can replace equals for equals. So anywhere, if I use true, I can also replace that with true and true. But that's only true, it, um, <laughs> meta level true here. It's the only, that is only the case if you, if all of these um, lines here, that sort of intuition about true and true being swappable with true 
if all of these lines are definitionally equal. And it turns out the way AGDA divides this, it has to start, it has to only use one argument first. So it's doing this case tree and it tries to figure out, you know, are you really branching on the first argument or the second argument? And this exact split will guarantee that all of your uh, function equalities that you define here are definitionally equal. So that throughout anywhere in your code, if you have true and true, you can swap that with true and AGDA won't even know the difference. Um, so let me um, give you an idea how that works. So if you have x and y equals something, let me case split. So let's just case split on, well, let's case split on both of them for now, I guess. Okay, let's kind of fill this back in and work backwards. So false, everything here is false, false, oops, false, ah, true. Okay. So one thing, if we take a look at what's going on here, uh, we see a pattern in the false cases. In both of the false cases, both of the results are false. So in that case, the second argument doesn't actually matter. Now notice I have an exact split here, and I'm using an underscore, but I am guaranteed that that's definitely equal. So essentially, somewhere if I say false and whatever, it's always going to be false. In the second case, I can simplify it by noting that um, true and something else always gives me that something else back. And so you could simplify it like this by giving a name to the second parameter and just returning that. And that's one way to simplify it. Are you doing some magic when you create a hole? I'm, I'm having a similar problem where it's not, where the connection's not recognizing the hole is even there. Me too. So you type a question mark and then I immediately do control C, control L. That's typically how I do it. And if I ever get lost, so control G, sometimes if I've started, like say I did control C, control N, and now I have an expression to normalize. Um, if I just want to cancel out of that, I just do a control G. And there's a question there. So I have a question about the linguistics. About what? Um, so in terms of how is like the parsing disambiguating function application from uh, these um, infix and mixfix stuff, uh, function application has a certain precedence level and these things have a, f I can't remember what the default is, I think function application is really high. So typically it, function application is going to happen f before anything else. But, and the default when you give an argument like this, I don't remember the default, but the default is a lower precedence. So by default putting, separating things by space is going to give you function application first. Um, but you can set that, I mean, you can give infix L means, so infix to and, and you can give it, I don't know, six, seven? Yeah, I suppose. I'd have to think of context. I mean, that's some downside to having, being able to uh, specify all your fixities is that you kind of have to intuit what you think they're going for. Um, right, so, okay, so there are cases, um, say we have example one is like, if you wanted to do and of fault, uh, you know, something like fault, you know, some other thing, I don't know, x and false like that, or maybe you call this f. So how do you know? Well, by default, this is going to be, if f is a function, then it's going to, that's going to be function application there, so it's going to do something like that. Um, but. Okay, so that is functional application work with adding and to f is more. If, um, yeah. Okay. But, I mean, so it, it distinguishes it, right? Because it, it'll look at f. I'm not that familiar with the internals of the 
parsing algorithm. But I think what it's going to do is look at f and say, what's the type of f? And if it's a function, it's probably going to think of that as function application first. I'm not sure if it type checks as it's parsing the tokens. Yeah. I never thought about that particular question, but I'm sure there's lots of really weird edge cases. And I think they even changed the parsing behavior so it, 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 between 2, 4, whatever, and 2, 5. So that, that kind of. Uh, Could you maybe get around it by specifying the fixedness of end? Or is that reserved for just operators? No, yeah, you can totally do that. I think I did that over here in the example. You say infix, and you give it a number. Um, you set it at like 9 or something. Yeah, I think 7 by default is. I don't remember what the default function application is. It's like 99 or something really high. All right. All good? Um, and right, so if we have or, you know, you can give or a, uh, sometimes it's nice to put all your fixities next to each other so that um, you, you know which one is going to bind more tightly. So if you have or x or y equals whatever, um, <clears throat> then if you have some expression like um, true and false or true, uh, so and is higher, so it's going to do true and false first and then or later. In that case, it might not have mattered. OK, let me do one more. Uh, let's do the if then else. So underscore, you can have as many underscores as you want. If then else, underscore. <laughs> Has three arguments. Let's make them all Booleans for the moment. Ah, there goes my Unicode. Boolean to Boolean to Boolean to Boolean, I think. So it takes three inputs. Um, if <coughs> some b, then x else y. Um, and we can just case split on the B. So then if it's false, we're going to return the second one. If it's true, we're going to return the first one. And if you want, you can use underscores here to indicate that you don't care about those arguments. Okie dokie. So... Is ACTA script? No, I, I think if you're going to give it a... I'm, I'm not sure the... There's a lot of nuances to that question, but generally it's lazy. Um, and I think you can get into really speaking about heated arguments about functional programming yeah. stuff. Um, I think you're going to find that in a total language, lazy is the right choice. Um, yeah? Can you explain a little bit about what you mean by total language for those of us that maybe, you know, stood up the house the last week? Yes, um, I think I have a little slide that shows something <coughs> like that. Total function. So if we have an input, if we have a set for, uh, a function from x to y, then um, a total function always deals with every element of x. So that's a total function. Doesn't matter what's happening on the output set. There's also a function. It's kind of it's one to one. So every element of x maps to exactly one element of y. Uh, in this case, you kind of lose information, so to speak, because you are handling all elements of x, um, but then y can't distinguish all of those. And this guy down here, we're not dealing with a case of one of the elements of x, and that is not a total function. And Agda will complain about it, like here. Let's not deal with that case. Let's leave it out. I was going to say, incomplete pattern matching for and. You're missing and true of something. So essentially, you have to account for everything in the input set when you write a function. And that's very important because a function, in that sense, is a proof. It's a proof of what? It's a proof that you have accounted for everything in the input set. So a function is really a proof of the totality of um, that mapping. So I, I cannot, like in Haskell, write a, a partial function in that? No. Nope. And that's what you're talking about, the total Yep. Yeah, all the functions have to be defined um, totally. Uh, if you, there are, I can't, I don't think you can even turn that off. Some of the options you can turn off, like termination checking. But, yeah? So does that actually mean that it is not a term language? 
Yep. And you can read, have lots of fun um, reading online about that. Like Connor McBride argued, has some good uh, things lately in some of his blogs about whether that's a good thing or not. And I don't think I have time to get into that. All right, so that gives us our if then else. So you can write something like if true, then false, um, else true, which is essentially equivalent to the not. Right, so you can write not prime. Let's rewrite not using our if. It's a Boolean to um, Boolean. So not prime, given a Boolean, we say if x is true, right, then false, else true. And now if we do not prime of um, true, that um, reduces to false. Okay, so uh, some. Fun thing about Agda and Unicode, you can type in lots of crazy Unicode characters in here. I mean, you could paste in lots of random stuff, emoji and whatnot. Um, and it all works, it's really crazy. So the only thing, but the, the downside to that is that everything has to be separated by spaces. So the only things that don't have to be separated by spaces are parens and these curly brace paren things. Um, so in particular, if you define a function or a data type with a comma in it, so you want to say a comma b, like you're going to write a comma b, and it's going to think that a comma is itself an identifier, and you, know, you really need to separate them. So just sort of FYI, I don't think I use comma anything here. All right, so very good. Let's, um, as an intro to dependent types, I'm going to jump right into dependent types here. Are you all ready? All right, I'm going to show you how to make this if polymorphic. Um, probably could have made the identity polymorphic too. Let's start with that one. Okay, so uh, the way you make something polymorphic is by passing in an extra parameter. Well, that is the set that you're going to use. Um, and but now you look. Okay, well, you can create a function from set to you know whatever to whatever, and that it, that's a good thing. Except. I want to like give a name to that set. Like I want to call the set X or something. So you can do that. What you do is you give a name to it and the syntax looks like that. Now I can use X here and X here. And that's how you create um, a polymorphic identity. Now uh, you might, but notice here we've given an extra parameter so you kind of need to give it another name down here. Now this, and so now identity at the moment has two arguments. One is the set. And the next thing is going to be an element of whatever set you gave it in the first place. So um, just a note on naming. When you give a name like this, that name is only valid to the end of, like, in here, the type signature. I mean, not to the end of the line, right? Because I can put these on different lines and it's happy. But this x down here is a totally different name. I can give this, you know, ABC or something. Um, just FYI, like, why am I getting all these x's all over the place? Why can't I use it? Um, just because this name here only applies throughout the, the functions. And this is a new name that we're also going to call x. Sorry. Okay, so how do we use this thing? Well, let's, um, we say identity and we pass in the set. Well, pass in a Boolean and then we give it a value of the Boolean, true. And that will reduce down to true. Um, identity of we have some other sets up here, right? Identity of one, and you pass in the only value you can, tt, and that will return tt, the value we gave it. Um, okay, so, well, I haven't motivated it, but you're gonna get really tired. I mean, it already feels really redundant. So, Agda has some amount of inference, so that, there's not, there's not this isn't like a really well-founded principle, but, you know, generally, if you're using the name of the thing later on, it can kind of figure out what you're talking about. So, in this case, try to, you're sort of, this is an implicit argument. Try to infer um, the value of this argument based on what you've given it later. In that case, you don't have to specify the type because it kind of, remember when we, um, if you do control C, control D to deduce a type, if we type in true, it can infer that that's a Boolean. 
And so, like, and likewise, if we say identity of true, what it's going to see is like, hey, you passed in true, I can infer that true is a Boolean. Oh, so I know X is a Boolean in that case. Um, so, now we kind of, now we've essentially have got the uh, polymorphic version of identity. Yep. Yep, there's really no difference except the curlies are inferred and the parens are always, you always, excuse me, have to manually um, pass them. Um, and so you might, the thing is like the infer, inference might break down, it's, it's not very general at all, and then you'll have to start passing them around. So um, the way you do that, you use something that looks like a record syntax, so you say identity and then you say, well, first, if they're in order, you can just pass in. Here, take Boolean, true. So you put the argument in parens in the right order. Um, and that reduced down to true. Uh, the other option is um, if, if you have lots of implicit um, arguments and you say control C, control N, I want to reduce an expression identity, um, you can give the name, you see you've given a name to it here. So you can use something like a record syntax where you say, I want X to be Boolean. Um, and you don't, like I said, curly parens, you don't need spaces around them. And then false. And that also works. Likewise, if you want to use X, the big set down here, you can do the same thing. So here, now, somewhere on the right, if you wanted to, you could use X somewhere. Um, likewise, if you have lots of implicit arguments, you can give another name to it, say, X is really ABC or something, and you can use ABC on the right. ABC. Um, not very useful right here. Just kind of showing you what what's there. All good? Yeah. Does have some sort of REPL? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of using it in some sense, right? I'm typing yeah, stuff on it. Um, but right when you do Control C, Control N, you are asking Agda to reduce an expression as much as possible to the canonical value. And it turns out that Agda is strongly normalizing, which means that any term you type will always reduce down to the same value, ultimately. That you won't get like, sometimes it reduces down to this value, sometimes it reduces down to some other value, depending on whatever. It's always going to reduce down to the same value. Um, but a REPL typically has like stuff in memory that you're keeping around. It's like, hey, create this variable here, and it's this big thing. Um, Agda doesn't really have a REPL like that. I mean, in some sense, the, the code you're writing is kind of like that. but. So when you switched from uh, parens to curly braces, did that actually, like, did, did all that value just not having to specify the extra like witness parameter in the function definition, or would you have had to actually pass that in each call sign after that? Yeah, you'd have to pass that. I mean, like, you mean if it was this form? Yeah. Yeah, you have to pass it everywhere. I'll show you, let me show you with uh, the if. Let's, let's um, generalize the if so that this type over here um, isn't all Boolean. So I'll, sh um, Right, so let's start with the, we have some X, capital X is a set, and that's gonna return a Boolean, well, eventually. But so the first parameter is a Boolean, because that's like our check, but all the rest of them are gonna be X. So now we have a little mix-fix problem, because like, well, this false really needs to be a set. So what you could do is you say four, you know, and add yet another, uh, whoa, for uh, X, you know. This is my set x. So now we kind of have this for if. So now it's like, well, if now it takes, it's really for, for Boolean, if x, then false, else true. And if I try to type in this tt, which isn't type Boolean, it's going to yell at me and say, that's not of type Boolean. Um, something like that. But, you know, it, like, I'm already telling it's Boolean up here. These can be inferred to be Boolean. It feels really redundant. And the more, the more programming you do like this, you're, it gets really tiring, especially with proofs. Um, so if you infer that here, well, then we don't really need this first parameter here. Um, it's going to be hard to get that back, unfortunately, uh, if you wanted to do something like this. But then, then we're kind of back to where we were before. So if x, then false, else true. And if, you know, I wanted this to be did I call it unit? No, I think I left it as one. If one, then one. Well, that's kind of a not very useful thing to do, but um, sorry.
Boolean. Boolean.